Okay. So it should According be the now, uh, it should be UK done pressing a button. But it was usually it's automatic. So it's recording now. Okay. There we go. So I'm going to recap real quickly. So the calling phase is this awakening phase, this beginning stage of a rite of passage. And um, through that calling, and when we're helped to navigate a calling uh, from a mythological lens rather than a patho pathological lens, um, then we get prescriptive responses that teach us how to navigate what I call the soul's descent. Um, Michael Mead, uh, uh, it's a, a storyteller, and he talks about two trajectories of initiation. He says, well, there's initiation by fire, and that's one he calls an ascent, where we're initiated uh, by the element of fire or by spirit. And it's like being possessed with a vision or an inspiration that you can't, you can't contain. You have, it just compels you. Um, and those kind of initiatory experiences like that by fire, we would say, also require a type of guide uh, because one can burn out like a bright star. It can be also be quite dangerous. Um, the other kind of initiatory experience is what we call one by water, and that is a descent, initiation into soul, into memory, into ancestry, into uh, healing and reconciliation. Um, and this is more of the initiatory descent. That's what, what these uh, rites of passages are, are often like. Um, so the calling brings us to the stage of what's called the severance phase. Once you align yourself to the calling, then you begin to notice what things in your life are beginning to drop away. Maybe some of them have already. Um, and they weren't intentional, just relationships or jobs or old ways of, of knowing yourself, these things all of a sudden start to fall away and you find yourself more and more stripped down of all the familiar ways of recognizing yourself or others. Um, and this is what we call the severance phase of the passage where you're, you're moving closer to that threshold. Now in a, in a, in a organized ritual ceremony, this would be intentional. This would be structured and choreographed this way of, kind of dismantling the ego and dismantling the identifications that have trapped us. Um, the way that we can often trap ourselves in stories that we tell about ourselves or stories that we tell about other people. Um, there's a, a, a great uh, man some time ago, his name was Ogmandino. He wrote this book, many of you may have heard, called The Greatest Salesman in the World. And he had this one quote that I loved that was said, he said, uh, if I said to you all of the things that you say to yourself about yourself, would we be friends? <laughs> and uh, you know, most people smile when they hear that. So, mm, maybe, maybe not. And it's like, well, that's the territory that's getting stripped away. These old stories and the way that we can take a story and trap ourselves in it or, or put it on another person and trap them in it. So in the severance phase, all these old ways of identifying how we belong to the world or how we even belong in our skin begin to fall, begin to fade. Um, and so this is nearing us. This is the, the dismantling. This is what we call the death launch. This is when I say, you know, initiatory passage is begin in darkness and move toward birth. And so this severance phase then uh, leads us to um, the threshold phase. The threshold phase is what most people think of when they hear the term rite of passage or vision fast or dream quest or vision quest or walk about, uh, they think, or hill walking, which is another term that might be used in the, in the ancient Great Britain. Um, it's the reference to the, to the solo time out in nature. And that's the, the thing most people think about when they hear those words. But that's just one phase we call the threshold phase. And that's what one is prepared, they're prepared by their elders, by their guides to enter the threshold phase, which is going into the wilderness. Um, open palms, empty heart, minimal provisions. Um, and the three, what I call the three taboos of the threshold phase that have been consistent across the planet in all cultures and in throughout history, the three 
the three taboos, as they call them, are fasting, exposure to the wilderness, and solitude. So that rites of passages may have looked different depending on where they showed up in the planet and in which culture, but at some point, they would have consistently had these three things in them, fasting, exposure, and solitude. So going into the wilderness and fasting and, and seeking vision and in prayer and in solitude, this, these are, this is the theme, this is the essence of the threshold phase of the, of the rite of passage. Um, all of the great spiritual traditions on the planet began with somebody going on a quest, uh, uh, hill walking or, or vision seeking. So we can think of uh, you know, the, the um, walkabouts and we can think of you know, Jesus going into the desert for 40 days and nights, Muhammad going up on the mountain, um, Buddha going out under the Bodhi tree, you know, countless Native Americans and Native cultures of, of those infamous people and their, their vision, vision quest ceremony of going into the wilderness fasting and praying for vision. So this is the, the threshold phase. You're prepared for that threshold phase. But the threshold phase is done uh, in solo, and it's designed to connect you more deeply with nature, especially in this day and age. Long time ago, that because everybody lived in nature, that was less of the challenge. Um, but connecting in nature into the sacredness that's present in nature. Um, so that when you're out on solo and you've prepared in a, in a good way to enter this threshold phase uh, as a ritual, as a ceremony, um, then everything you encounter in that time period, whether it's four days and nights, which is a traditional period of time, or one, however, even if it's shorter, doesn't matter, um, is that you recognize that everything you encounter in that time period has medicine to offer you. And you begin to read the, the landscape of your experience uh, through a different lens and your encounters during that time. That's the threshold phase. And the fasting, the exposure, and solitude is to create a perceived experience of risk. There is some risk, of course. Mostly it's perceived risk. Um, uh, but there's a perceived risk, and the presence of that is what, what brings one into connection with their understanding of the sacred. Uh, because it's not meant to be a ceremony that you can, well, just go out in, the, out in the woods and camp out for four days and come back and tell us how it was. No, it's designed to take you to the edge of, of your emotional capacity to hold your experience so that you have to reach out for something greater than yourself whether it's that river that's flowing beside you or that mountain you're looking at or, or the name of the creator that you work, operate by and how you understand that, you're going to reach for something greater than yourself um, because you're crying for vision. You're asking for something um, that's outside your awareness to, to come in. Um, so it's designed to break all of these, uh, all the social facades. As I say, the, the standing tall people, the tree people don't care what you do for a living. The river has no concern about your reputation. <laughs> and the birds uh, are not interested in how you compare to this other person doing this other thing. They're not interested in any of that. Uh, and so all of those, that inner dialogue that we carry around most, most of the time just falls away. And then you're left... Uh, with walking through often a threshold of emotion and awakening and then some connection to an awareness of the sacred, however that occurs to you. Um, and then with that experience, there's often a, what I would call a download of insight. When you let go deep enough, when you surrender uh, complete enough so that spring simply shows up because you let go enough, that's why I think about the, the turning of the wheel between the winter and the spring is that we, we surrender uh, so deeply that spring simply shows up because we have, let go, we have let go enough. And in that surrender, we're met by something 
uh, called grace, something that could not otherwise find us unless we surrender deeply enough. Um, we've all had these kind of experiences that haven't been choreographed in a ceremonial way. The loss of a loved one can crack you wide open, can leave us on the floor in grief and in anguish, and something comes in in that moment that cannot be explained. You know, we've, we've had, if you've been on the planet long enough, you've had those. Um, so this kind of choreographed, ritualized experience is, is uh, ancient peoples knew, well, this is how you do this. You have to do this like voluntarily. And uh, as, uh, as I would say, when you can do it voluntarily or you can do it involuntarily. Uh, we can't get through life without it happening. Um, and also using the rites of passages to mark certain events in our lives. You know, the decision to marry, the decision to divorce, the decision to have a child, the decision to change careers, the decision uh, to, to uh, you know, shift something, change something. These are all beautiful reasons to choreograph such a such a ritualized or ceremonial experience where one goes into nature to mark um, saying uh, entrance into manhood um, which I find for a lot of the men that I've worked with they've, they've never had a traditional way or or womanhood and they find themselves doing it for the first time at 40 or 45 it's like well I never actually had that experience to really ritually ceremonially mark this shift um, so we can see, you know, often the result of the absence of rites of passage is that we uh, begin to identify ourselves with the uh, cultural myth, or not, I wouldn't even say culture, that's, that's being too kind, society myth. Um, if, you don't, if you don't awaken to the mythology within you, the one that you carry, um, then we often unconsciously adopt the mythology of the greater society around us. And I think it was Joseph Campbell that once said, if you want to know the mythology of the society you live in, just look around and see what the tallest buildings are. And there, there you will find the, the society's myth. And so certainly we live in a, in a society where the mythology is our economic structures, and monetary structures these are the tallest places um, where they used to be holy places we go back you know hundreds thousands of years um, so to awaken to your personal mythology um, that what you carry is is, is to unplug um, from an unconscious myth that you may have been operating by as I say if you if you don't awaken to the mythology that you carry, you'll likely be living a life that's not entirely your own. And so uh, I think there's a, I don't think there, there, there's an urgency of rising in our, in our world today of, of need to wake up to that and to wake up in, in, a, in a way without judgment or blame. Um, but it's time for people to step fully into the the gift and the beauty and the medicine that they each carry. Uh, there's not going to be a president or a, uh, a queen or a king or something that's going to save us. You know, this is going to happen at a grassroots roots level of change where you, you step more fully into the life of your belonging, the one that you were, you came here to live. So this threshold phase is, is that, uh, that, uh, to use a Joanna Macy term, you, you step onto the knife's edge of uncertainty because it's only when we're on the knife's edge of uncertainty that our most creative potential is awakened. Um, and so again, there's, this is the, the time in the wilderness, this is the threshold phase. And then there's the return. So the return is uh, coming back out of the desert, coming down off the mountain, coming back up from the river, back to the village, the village that was holding space. And maybe you did it with others um, so that there was, there's somebody holding the fire for you while you're out there. And you return to this village and you return with what? You re return with a story. 
you return with a story of what happened out there in your encounter. You know, uh, what happened uh, in your encounters with nature, with the animals, with the weather. And, and then embedded in the story is information, uh, soul information, um, that you, you come and after a period of, of kind of settling back into the village, you then sit in what we call the elders council and you share your story. And you share it with those who have been out there before and they listen and then they say, uh, well, I'm seeing some of your names around the screen. They might say, well, Simon, I hear the story of a man who went into the wilderness to do this. And in this story, Susie, I hear that she had this encounter with elk and this and this happened and this gave her this teaching. And then, uh, and then uh, Eagle came in and uh, just as, as you, Astrid, were sitting by this river, came in and landed on a branch in front of you. And you got this information that was transferred to you. You had this awakening, this experience. And so your story is married back to you in a way that is what we call your personal myth-making. Um, so the, heirs, the, the elders would mirror back. Here's what I hear in your story about what happened to this one that went out there. Um, and then there's the incorporation phase, the, the return, the incorporation, or what I call the giveaway phase. So the giveaway phase is your life. What do you do with this? You know, now that you've returned, maybe you return to a town, a village, a city. Um, nobody really knows what you did um, or would even understand it if you told them. Um, so how do you carry this, this uh, vision in your heart, in your belly? How do you carry this back into that arena? And that becomes your incorporation, your giveaway. You know? um, and as I say, the giveaway is really the rest of your life. You know, how, do you, how do you bring this? And maybe you make, you know, going to the mountain, as I say, once, is not, is not, it's just not a one-time thing. You would go, it might go many times. Um, in the course of a lifetime through this through this experience in return so the calling the severance the threshold the return the incorporation um, these are the sequences uh, our choreography of a of a rite of passage um, that can be intentional and conscious and guided um, the unintentional ones don't often complete themselves, unfortunately. The unintentional ones uh, are activated and awakened with calling and severance. And it's often in that phase uh, that we may pathologize ourselves or fall victim to the absence of initiated elders, anyone to, to help us. Um, you know, it's when um, there's a... a a quote, I can't remember the quote quite late, but something around, um, there was a, a young lady who, uh, so, so I recently received a letter from a friend telling me about someone who just recently committed suicide. They jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and they had been wounded deeply as a child and found no help. And the letter had already asked, how does one, you know, transition from, from, young adulthood or adolescence into adulthood, or I would say transition from any stage of life to another without breaking down. And it had answered through tradition, through rites of passage, through these ancient ceremonies and, and, and rituals that would assist one across. And I can't tell you how many people I've run into in my life that will be in that severance phase, and all of a sudden they, they start feeling suicidal. And I, I tell them, well, you are correct. There is something that is needing to die here. But it is not you. That's the misinterpretation. You're in a soul's descent. Uh, you're, you're in this awakening uh, process that begins with dismantling. Um, and this is where it's important to, to see it mythologically rather than pathologically. Because the tendency to misinterpret that type of awakening 
uh, can cost us greatly. And so uh, the, these are why these, these ancient ceremonies, rituals existed. Um, this, this going into nature, uh, having an experience and returning with a story, and then being held by some guidance um, to, to understand the experience and then to bring that back into my life. And the other important thing with all of, with, with the rites of passage is that, um, you know, having a background in psychotherapy and psychology for 35 years, I, I, I have the liberty to say this. We have a, a, a society that likes to psychologize um, things into workshops and retreats. And you only go to a workshop and retreat if you feel it would be good for you, right? Or if you feel like it. <laughs> and I say, oh, no, ritual and ceremony is not something you do because you feel like it or because it will be good for you, although it will. You do it because it is to, you do it for your people. You do it to awaken that which you have to offer. So the reason for doing it is not simply connected to ourselves as individuals. It's connected to what we have to offer. Um, and what you have to offer is like your thumbprint. If you don't offer it, it won't happen. It's not like somebody else is going to be you. And in and, and, and the beautiful way that only you can truly be you. In the healing way that only you can do that. Nobody else is going to do that. Um, and so this is the, the, um, the call, the, the awakening. It's like it, there's something in us that wakes up um, and calls that forward. And, I, and um, I was first aware of it when I was around 13 or 14. Um, and it got activated in me, and I didn't really understand it. It wasn't really part of my world. I did spend time in nature, um, but I had the idea of wanting to do – that process I just described, I would say, well, I would like to do this and I want somebody to take me and, and guide me in this and then take me out and drop me off. And then I want to come back and talk about it. And so I could describe it at that age, but I had no idea that there was such a thing. Um, and it was only later um, when my father died, I was uh, 32. So this was I don't know, 25 years ago. Um, that that memory of the 14 year old woke up. And with my father's death, I, this calling rose up again to do this thing. And I found my way on, uh, on this, uh, this path that brought me into this experience. Um, and so I, I came to see that I believe this is something that is in our bone memory. It's in our ancestral memory, uh, the, this desire, this, this longing for the initiatory quest or journey. It's in all of us, um, and it can take many forms. Um, those that survive the, well, all of us look like survived our adolescence. <laughs> um, but this, this tendency in adolescence to uh, seek out dangerous experiences, risky behaviors and dangerous this is what the, I think Michael Mead called brushing up against the sacred because it's only when we encounter uh, dangerous life-threatening experiences that it activates this, this connection to the sacred, like it brushes up against it. And so in an initiatory passage, that's a similar process of bringing one to brush up against what, what is perceived as, wow, this would be, you know, I'm going I mean, go out there and four days and nights so i'm going to be out there with just water and and minimal provisions yeah that could be what happens and so you it brushes you up against uh the perception of risk and therefore the sacred um, and so we can see in those in those reckless behaviors that then become reckless behaviors of adults because they never had the initiatory experience they just perpetuate the adolescent behavior through adulthood. Um, this, this desire, the seeking of the, um, the initiatory quest. Um, so I've come to believe that it's really in us. Um, so I want to pause there before getting more specific into uh, some of the offerings we have. And, and 
see what's stirring out there with all of you. What uh, thoughts, questions, memories. There, there's one way I've learned to listen to stories. And I'll offer you this. It's just a little piece of information I learned from a lady named Angelus Arian, wonderful storyteller, anthropologist. She said, uh, stories uh, are not meant to be understood. If you understand the story, it's dead. It has nothing more to teach you. The point of stories, medicine stories, the point of medicine stories is that you pay attention to where you enter the story. And though I may have been talking in you know, three, four, five minutes, I said something and you entered there. I said, I have no idea what he said before we got to that point, but I heard that and I came in and I heard everything else. So I entered the story at this point. Or where in the story did, did the story catch your attention and you stopped? And the story kept going, but you didn't go with it. You stayed back there and you have no idea what, where the story went because you didn't go there. You just, you got hooked right here and you stayed there. That's another important thing to notice in medicine stories. And then the third place is where in the story did something happen in the story that activated something in you and you left this story and went into your own story, either your history or one in, one in the possible future. And what happened in this story that, sent, that opened the door? And when the door opened, where did you go? And what happened there? And so medicine stories are about being living and breathing entities that we, we notice, where did we enter it? And what happened? What was happening there where I entered? Or where did I stop? What was happening there? Or where did, I, where did the door open and I left? And where did I go? And that way we can hear, that's why medicine stories could be told hundreds of times to the same listener because it was never about understanding. It was always about relationship. So uh, I want to open the, the, the circle here a little bit more and invite you in to share something, a question. Maybe there's a question you have uh, or something got activated. Um, and also tracking the time. Uh, let's see, Carol, if you'll track the time for us, um, uh, maybe you can tell us where we are right now since I don't have that, I can't see it on my screen. Um, oh, that's right, you're not East Coast time. So let me take a quick look. Okay, I see where we are. All right, so what, what stirs for you and anything that's been said so far? And just click off your mic and, and speak. Question, a thought. I have a question. Yes, Anne. Hi. Um, so I'm sort of, I'm, I'm just beginning to be drawn to these kinds of things. And I've listened to you speak several times and it's completely inspired me. Mm -hmm. But I'm older and I live a kind of, I'm just concerned about how do I know something like this would be right for me? Because I've been studying a lot about the nervous system and I'm just thrilled that you're a therapist. So you'll understand what I'm trying to say is when you're pushed to the edge, mm -hmm. like you say, mm -hmm. and you know, how do you know that you're ready and that these pushing you to the edge is not going to like, you know, overwhelm and, you know, shut you down and it's going to be counterproductive. Right. I understand that. Yes. Great yeah. question. Um, yes. Cause the, the full experience I'm talking about is not for everybody. There, there are graduated experiences. Maybe one just goes out for a day on, on in nature and comes back in the afternoon and, and they do the same preparation and so they go into the fast and they just walk in nature for a day fasting and take their journal and they come back and share their story. Um, that's, a, that's another, uh, that, that's no less powerful. It's powerful in a very different way. Or maybe one does like a 24 hour, just a, an, an, an all night and then comes back. Um, but it also having a guide, like I have over the years, I'll have many people say, well, I did think about, it. I just uh, have this place near my house and I could just, I just thought I, I needed to head off in nature and just be alone for a while. And, Go, go on, you know, a quest that way. It's like, well, you could do that. Um, but you won't, having a guide that can help you know the things that you don't know you don't know. Um, I've always found that useful to uh, have 
at least a couple of my pe- a couple of people in my life that are those people, the ones that can point out the things that I don't know I don't know, um, and guide me. So that would be important is is to have a guide that you trust, not to, uh, you know, recommend or guide you into a situation that's that's overwhelming. Um, and knowing what. So are you saying, are you saying you'd act, do it with somebody? It would, wouldn't be a solo. No, I would, what I'm suggesting is definitely having a guide. If you heard in the beginning, the guide is the important part. Is have one someone that can support you and guide you through a process. Um, and it can be very, uh, it can be abbreviated in a, a multitude of ways. It doesn't have to look like the, the whole immersion that I talked about and the one I'm going to talk a little more about. It can be very graduated and very, it, it can meet you where you are. Um, they wouldn't be out there with you. They'd be maybe holding fire somewhere. Is that correct? I see. Yeah, so, in, in, and I'll describe more of the details of our experience and how we actually do that, um, rather than just a gym. Okay. But yeah, it would be, so if, 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 you, if I was going to guide, if you came to me and said, Cater, I'm, I'm interested in this, uh, this quest you're doing in Spain, how, will I know, how would I know if I'm ready? I said, well, first let's have some conversations. I'll, and I'll give you some readings, and, and uh, particularly after you've read them, you can tell me after you read this, you'll know, yes, this is, this calls me more deeply or no, this isn't what I want to do. Um, so I'm, the first stage is like, is this really something uh, that you're feel called to? It's not, uh, not, and I'll say this about myself and anyone else. Uh, just because you feel inspired by the person that's talking doesn't mean you want to go do what they say do <laughs> or what they're suggesting. <laughs> You right. won't let it. You need for it to have your own belonging to the ceremony. Um, so, any guide is going to help you find your way. Uh, is whether is this for me? Is this not for me? Um, okay. And is there a part of it that may be for me without doing all of that? You know, all of the the deeper things. So it's that would be an important piece. Okay. Other Thank questions? You. Yeah. Hi. Um. I be interested i'm assuming you can see me because i I'm, I'm seeing someone else on the screen and you can hear me and i should continue is this jill yes it is hi okay. Okay. hi I see. um yeah so i'd be interested to find out um more about whether it is right for me in in april um I'm aware that like when you talk about the seventh phase that really resonates um I'm, I feel like I've been giving up food and at the moment I'm fruitarian and but I feel really at the kind of like I'm coming to a knife's edge because I'm thinking shall I try this pranic not eating thing or is that absolutely crazy and I feel drawn to give up my house and 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 nature wise it makes so much sense but then i think am i completely crazy so um yeah i feel like there's severance stuff going on Mm -hmm. um and i feel also like i'm also like like mini quests are going on at night time so i'll have these things where um so say yesterday i was thinking oh my god i'm losing too much weight this i you know are you gonna are you, are you mad and then it gets to a point where i go do you know what it doesn't matter i'm doing this anyway and it feels right mm-hmm. and then i get like this overwhelming kind of joy feeling mm-hmm. so i think okay go with it but i'm also aware that i'm thinking what i don't know i don't know like i like that saying that you said what about the things that you don't know you don't know yeah, yeah. so that's I guess what I'm so you're thinking about it how do you know what's right for you and you're and you find yourself in a severance phase already lots of things are coming under question should I let go of this should I let go of this and and uh and undergoing these uh, imagine certain uh protocols of uh, uh living on prana which I know there are a number of them out there um I don't want to mention any of them but I know there are some protocols of 
of that process, be it a seven day, a 21 day, uh, and I've known people that do that and have done that. Um, and I can't say uh, that that is or isn't right for you. I would, you know, I'm, I'm looking more to trust and look what's happening in you. Um, but how to bring this to a ceremonial way of marking this, um, this shift. Um, is Jill still there or we lose Jill? Yes, I'm... Oh, there you are. Good. My screen changed all of a sudden. <laughs> um, and so that could be the process of, uh, in the severance phase and what I call the death lodge phase, what, getting clear about what am I marking? Uh, what am I marking with this, with this ceremonial experience? So you're not just kind of blindly going into, uh, well, I just want to go out in nature and have an epiphany. It's like, so why are you going out there? What is this about? Well, I'm marking, um, and you may begin to think about this question. What is it that I want to mark with this severance phase, with this initiatory passage, however you decide to do it? Am I marking uh, the end of this old way of being that I define real clearly? Am I marking... Uh, the beginning of this new way that I'm defining in this way? Or am I marking this betwixt and between phase of uncertainty? What, what am I marking with this? The, um, the actual ritual or the ceremony of the rite of passage would take what you're going through and help you clarify what is it that's going on? What's shifting? What's marking? What's ready to be put down? And what it's ready to be ready to be picked up, um, and so there's preparation for those, you know. In, in our so we do an 11 day immersion in nature, um, and in that 11 days, the first part of the 11 days is, you know, identifying your strengths and challenges uh, in connection to nature, meaning nature as a reflection of you, and the seasons as a reflection of you. So do you have strength in the East with awareness and clarity, or do you have strength in the South, which action? Do you have strength in the West where the water is with introspection and nourishment, or do you have strength in the North with, uh, with holding space, with, with letting go, with, with being an elder kind of energy? So these, you, you find where your strengths and challenges are, and then we move into Death Lodge. It's the next part of the, the program where we do individualized ritual with each person that's going to be going out on the land individualized but with the group focus so there's a organic spontaneous ritual that evolves for you around whatever's happening in which anything could come up and those that's where the area of the things you don't know you don't know come up <laughs> um, and we work with those um, and that's part of the preparation and then we do a, a, a purification ceremony the night before we send y'all out and then the next uh and then we send people out uh with their stone pile buddy so you go out in pairs onto the land and we prepare people with uh will you know birth, basic wilderness safety information here's all the what to do if uh information and we know where everybody is on the land the staff's like okay Jill's over there and she's partnered up with Carol who's over here and they'll be checking on each other without seeing each other in this way, which we teach people about the stone pile and how to do that. But you're out there and then you're out there for your four days and nights and you come back. And in that period you do a water fast unless there's some medical reason why that's not going to work, um, which we screen for all of that. Um, and you spend that time out on the land after all of that preparation, um, it's like the first five days are at base camp and preparing for the four days. And then you come back after the four days with your story. And then we sit and counsel and listen to all the stories and offer reflections of what we hear married in your story. Um, and then we do a giveaway ceremony. What's that? You said water fast. You meant food fast. Oh yeah. So yeah. Water means what you, you have a gallon of water every day to drink. Um, unless there's some medical reason, there's, there's only a few contraindications or, or things that would not be okay to, to do this with. And I'll, and I'll screen for those. Um, 
you know, type one diabetes uh, could be one. I've, I have a daughter who has type one, so I've parented that all of my life. Some I've even taken people who have diabetes and we just work out how they eat um, and make sure their blood levels are checked every day and all of that. So, but essentially you're, you're monitored during the four days, but you don't see anybody. But we're checking, we're we're checking in on you in different ways. We're no, you know, make sure that you're doing okay, that you're safe. But you're not engaging with people. It's just you and nature. You don't know that you're, you know, monitored. You don't see anybody. Um, and then you come back with your story um, and what happened out there. Um, so this, that would be the, the process of, of uh, often people that are in a severance phase like you, Jill, they're often drawn to it. It's like, oh, this is like, this would be a ceremony that would help me do what I'm trying to do myself. Um, and so I always recommend, even if you're doing one of those protocols of, um, of uh, living on prana, let's say which I know a few of them out there, um, then you want to have you want to have some guidance. You want to have somebody that's kind of tracking and supporting, and uh, somebody can touch in with. Um, is that helpful information? Yeah, it's very helpful. And um, I saw your talk at the um, at, a, at that online conference just recently, mm -hmm. um, the Fire Keepers, mm -hmm. um, and yeah i'm not as nervous about the whole epilepsy thing because i know i don't um because i'm realizing that that this is part of it it's letting go and um and i'm aware that what uh, what also happens is like i'll have worries about oh no what about b12 and then when i get to the point of do you know what i'm going to not take b12 anyway again that kind of lovely feeling and stuff so i'm aware that i have these mini little things but i'll also forget the learning from them and go back to deep worry about it that kind of thing so that's making me or i'll just ignore the message that was coming through and then it just gets more challenging when you do that <laughs> So this is why I'm thinking, yeah, okay, so I'm having these little mini thingies happening, but yeah, maybe this is, the quest is what I need rather than just trying to go it alone. Yeah, I highly recommend doing this in community. You uh, have three minutes left. And I also want to clarify when I said, you know, fasting on water, um, it is never recommended that anybody comes off any medication that they're taking. There's always, you know, check with your doctor, make sure you can do a fast um, for three or four days and maintain what you're on. So I never, I'm not altering or suggesting anybody not follow uh, whatever protocols of, of medication they've been following. That's between them and their caregiver. So this would be different. And we'll, you know, you know we'll, we'll have medical questionnaires and all that. To, if there are conversations that need to be had about it. Thank you, Kato. You're welcome. Anything else? No, we're kind of coming up on our end of our time here. Uh, just, just real quick. Uh, I just wanted to tell you, thank you for answering my email. And I don't know if y'all saw my daughter sneak in. It was right during the time where you were talking about offering. Mm -hmm. And she's like, what do you have to offer daddy? And it's like, other than being a father and providing for y'all and, that's what I'm looking for. So I guess that's why I'm here. Yeah, you're, you're most welcome, Adam. And being a father, as I'm a father of two daughters, um, is, is one of my greatest offerings, you know, doing that well. Yeah. Um, due, to, uh, due to some health problems here the past year, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to continue in the career that I thought I'd retire from. So that's why I reached out to you. Uh, I did an anime's quest a couple years ago and a lady that was on the quest with me recommended you and I've been keeping an eye on you for, I don't know, two or three years now. And I'm like, well, I guess now's the time. Mm -hmm. So. All right. Well, maybe we'll have some more conversation. 
You know, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I just want to say thank you. I'm not quite sure how I got here. <laughs> um, I don't know what made me sign up, but it's been very interesting and very stirring. I'm cracked wide open. I don't know if you recall our session. I do. You do. <laughs> So yeah, the, the, the thing with my son is going on and going on mm -hmm. and I feel I have to come down to earth and in a real deep crisis, I'm hardly sleeping. It's probably the biggest crisis in my life so far. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been interesting to receive that email about tonight and I had actually no intention of signing up and yet I did. <laughs> so I don't know where this is gonna go, but thank you. Yeah, you're, you're quite welcome. So I just want to say we will um, we have the uh, village encampment with the quest in Spain, um, southern Spain, I believe it is, uh, coming up April twentieth um, to May first, and then we have um, the quest here in Asheville, North Carolina, May nineteenth um, to the 29th, and then another one here in Asheville, North Carolina mountains. Uh, I think it's October fifth to the fifteenth. Um, so those are three different ones that are happening this year. Um, so if they interest you, um, and then there's other ways to connect. Uh, some of you have done personal divinations with me, which is a one-on-one -on -one session that is either in person if you're here or like this, um, which is using what's called calorie shell divination. Um, and it's an hour and a half session. And then there are other, there's an introductory weekend we're doing here in North Carolina in April. Um, that's kind of an intro to the larger program. That's a, a, a three-day experience, Friday to Sunday. Um, and then grief rituals. There's a grief ritual happening in Portugal um, after the quest. And then there's a grief ritual happening in the UK. I'm not sure the exact time yet. It's later this summer. Um, and then one over here. And those are also very powerful experiences. Um, so yeah, so I'd love to, love to see you all around that fire sometime. And Kater, are you starting a new training group too? Oh yes, the training, the training, the training. Um, so it's a 14 month long training that begins in October. I mean, begins in August. Uh, the quest is a prerequisite. Um, so it'd be important to do a quest before you begin to train as, as in that work to, um, and so the training is training as a rites of passage uh, guide, a ceremonial guide. So it's just not taking people out into nature, but it's uh, guiding people in a ceremonial way. Um, and that's not just as guiding people through a four day, four night, 11 day experience. Uh, the training goes much deeper. If you, if you want to know more about the training, you can click on the website and read the what, what the information there is about, but it's really training people to um, engage people with nature and with ceremony and, and everywhere from taking them out in four days and nights uh, on solo to, you know, giving them a homework assignment to go out in nature and do a particular ritual. Um, so it kind of covers a, a large spectrum. Um, but that begins in August and then we meet six times across the the 14 months for six different sessions. And uh, again, I'm happy to share more of that with you. Um, and it includes a vision quest in the training. Yeah, there's a vision quest in the training, um, separate than the one that's the prerequisite for the training. So the training, the quest for the guides, and when you're training to be a guide, we do a specific quest uh, for you as well with your group that you've been meeting with throughout the year. Um, I just wanted to say also a couple of things, Kada. Yeah. So one is um, just for those of us who live in Europe that we have been, myself and uh, Carol and Kada, we have just, I, I have been personally uh, inspired to um, enable somehow these teachings to come more, to be more accessible to those who live in Europe and in, in the UK because it's not so easy to go to America. So. So this vision quest in Spain is, is the vision quest that is in Europe this year. Hopefully we will have it and also next year. And just, uh, just for all of us who are here from, you know, residing in Europe to, um, 
yeah, to make an effort to um, to talk to others and and uh, and um, and share these this wisdom. And um, and from Keda, I wanted to say Keda, where uh, where people could find all this information on your website, yeah, on the Rites of Passage. The the, the Rites of Passage Council website, and also the um, the uh, my personal website. So, which is just caterbrown.com, K-E-D-A-R. Um, I will send out uh, an email to everyone that registered for the webinar, um, asking your permission, one, to, to join the mailing list if you would like. And also, I'll give you the, the information, the two website links, um, where you can go read more about the training or the quest. And also, um, in the email, there'll be a... a you know, if you want to schedule a, a like a 20 minute consult, a free consult with me to talk about one of these, um, just do, you can just go on to click that and it'll take you to a scheduling site and you just set up a time and uh, schedule a time for us to chat. And I'll be glad to spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes just checking in with you about um, any of your interest. If there you have some more personal questions about it, happy to do that. All right, so I think we're we're a little bit over our, over the time, but we did pretty good for a five my time. So thank everyone for being here, and again, um, we, I hope to to see you around one of those sacred fires down the road somewhere, and uh, wish you all well. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Kada. Everybody, go well. <laughs>